Okay, so hi, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. So welcome to the Breakout Builder once again. And we have amongst us uh, Naveen. Uh, he'll be presenting uh, Scratch Containers and the Supply Chain Troubles. So Naveen is a uh, Naveen is passionate about information security. He works as a senior uh, security engineer at FresherWorks with interests related to application security, threat modeling, uh, DevSec, DevSecOps. So uh, welcome, Naveen. Uh, I would request you to please uh, share your screen and present it for the audience. And uh, for the audience, uh, you can ask questions. You can ask your questions in the Q&A that's available on the right side of your, uh, if you're using the web application, otherwise application. Uh, so over to you, Naveen. Hey, thanks, Arpit. Um, hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're attending from. So my name is Naveen. So Arpit gave a good introduction. Uh, so I think that's good. Um, let me share my screen and continue. So... I'm hoping that my screen is visible to everybody. Um, so this press, this talk is all about uh, discussing the concept of scratch containers, and uh, we look, uh, you know, building scratch containers would be uh, helpful to us from a security perspective, or would it cause a lot of trouble in terms of supply chain security and all the all of that. Um, so a bit about me, I come from this beautiful city called Chennai, which is in Tamil Nadu in India. Uh, so just like I said, I work in Freshworks. Um, I like to talk with people. I work with a lot of engineers here on building new solutions, uh, getting security to shift to left and all of that. Um, so that's mostly what I do at work. And, uh, Apart from work, yeah, I like a lot of music and love watching these MCU movies. And uh, apart from all of these uh, main hustles, I work with some communities in the city. So GDG Chennai is one of the communities that I kind of work with. Um, if you don't know what GDG is, it stands for Google Developer Groups. It's part of a Google Developers Program. And uh, uh, if you'd like to engage, uh, just let me know through LinkedIn or any social media. There could be a chapter around your city so you can talk with them. So that's about me. Uh, so a little bit of disclaimer before we get into the presentation. Uh, so most of what I'll be talking about today is, is kind of an experiment that I've been working on for some time and a little bit of reach, research area, uh, which I'm kind of trying to do. Uh, so do not take this seriously and try to you know have this in your production and then you know, don't break stuff. So that's a bit of disclaimer. Um, so getting started, um, talking about scratch containers, uh, let's get into the topic. But before talking about containers, let me just give, you know, a little bit of overview about containers in case somebody's not familiar with the term or kind of, you know, not used it before. Uh, so a container is nothing but it's a way of uh, running applications in an isolated manner. Uh, so containers uh, help you run applications and uh, it provides you an environment where uh, even though you change your host, your, you change your machines, uh, the application is always behaving the same way it's supposed to because uh, the environment it's running is always same. Um, so that's a little bit of a high level definition of what a container does. Um, so when talking about it, it's not like a virtual machine, but it's basically just uh, you know a bunch of files uh, which is in the format of tar. Uh, so these files are just layered up in a way that uh, it is reusable and can be distributed to different people, different people. And um, so there is a there's kind of a format for every containers. So you'd always have a base image. And on top of base image, you would have your applications and other logic on top of it. Um, so that's how it is uh, stacked up. On the right side, so I've just you know drawn kind of what it looks like. So you would have layers, and first layer is usually a base image, which could be your operating system. 
Um, then you would have your system dependencies, your packages and all that. And then you would have your application third-party dependencies and then your application itself. Uh, so that's usually what makes up a container. And when talking about base image, um, just like I said, it's usually an operating system or any runtime. So it could be, say, for example, it could be something like Ubuntu, Debian, Alpine, or it could be something like Python, Golang, JDK, and all of these things, right? Um, and mostly these containers, when they build these images as well, these would also have some parent image, which could be another operating system, right? But uh, there'd be questions like, you know, when they build a base image, uh, say the very first base image, right? Like an operating system or whatever, what would be its parent image, right? Uh, so that'd be a question. So that is when the concept of scratch comes in, when uh, the, which we'll be talking about it a little bit after this. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the common problems that we deal with these base images, right? I call this a base image trouble. Usually the problems that we face is, you know, when you try to build up uh, your container images, uh, your parent image would be either too huge or either too old or it's unpatched, right? Uh, so it takes time to pull your image. Uh, you might have to update it. You know, sometimes the patches aren't available because it's too old, it has never been rebuilt and all that. And usually when we see from the security pers perspective, old images and unpatched images are always the biggest problems, right? The biggest concerns. Old images are basically, you know, the ones which have not been rebuilt over time. So they do not have the latest dependencies. So oftentimes it is possible that the older dependencies and older packages contain a lot of CVEs. Uh, which means you would have to, you know, uh, run some commands to update those packages during your build time, like apt update, apt install certain packages. So that is when these get updated. So which means you have to do a lot of stages at your build time, right? This would uh, make your build steps complex. Your Docker files would be big and, uh, you know, it's hard to maintain and all that. Unpatched is when, you know, uh, say it's very pretty old, right? A very old version of Debian or something like that, uh, wherein you try to, you know, uh, update those packages and there are no security patches available. Um, say, for example, OpenSSL1 and your application relies on OpenSSL1 and that has a CV. Uh, so, this, so the only way to go around is going for 1.1, right? Uh, so things like that. Uh, it would always leave your container vulnerable for any CVs present. So patching the patching such vulnerabilities are impossible, which means you're left with the vulnerabilities and you have to deal with it. Uh, so these are uh, problems that we commonly face. Uh, so there are various strategies that people would adopt to overcome such challenges. Like, uh, for example, uh, you would only try to have the dependencies that you need in your container for your application to run. Right. Um, so Scratch is a concept that has picked up some kind of uh, traction around here. Um, so what is Scratch? Scratch is basically a parent image or a very basic empty image, right? It helps you build your own base images. So Scratch is a kind of a research word, a word in Docker. Uh, wherein say you want to build a base image or a parent image and share it with somebody and you do not want to have a parent image on top of it, right? Say, for example, you want to build your own version of Debian, right? And you do not want to have another parent image on top of it, which makes no point. So in cases like that, you would use this, uh, this parent image called Scratch. Uh, but however, it's since it's a reserved word, there is nothing attached to it, which means it's an empty image. And uh, if it's empty, which means you cannot pull it from the hub and uh, it's just a reserved word. So whenever you use it in your application, your uh, Docker or any container building application would understand that it is meant to be empty and uh, it would use an empty layer and uh, proceed uh, to the next instructions. So building a project in Scratch would involve you to have multi-stage builds Wherein in stage one, you would use some parent image, say for example, your runtime like Go, you build your application. And the next step, you would copy that 
uh, built binary into your uh, scratch container and then you know distribute it so just like i said scratch is nothing but an empty base image so also a good thing is that when you use a scratch image right a scratch parent it does not add an additional layer to your container which means it is going to sustainably uh, reduce the size of your container image usually when you use a parent image like ubuntu or something it would add a layer to top of your container image which means the size of your parent image also would impact the size of your final container image whereas in scratch that is not the case so why scratch so uh, just before i explain what is scratch i told that uh, there are various strategies adopted to you know uh, have what is needed in your container right what only your application needs why we do that is because you know there are redundant packages in the container which could probably expose you to certain vulnerabilities and we don't want that right and uh, that is why we try to reduce all that and keep what is needed so this thereby reduce uh, reduces the attack surface and tries to you know uh, keep you uh, from ex exposing yourself so that's a bit about scratch and uh, going into how it looks and how it works i'll probably you know walk you through some examples uh, so here i have a sample golang app here which is uh, which is a docker file here uh, so you see i have two stages in the first stage i try to build a golang application and in the second stage i copy the you know the built binary into the scratch container and i distribute it right uh, so here in my case in my application i have a very simple application a hello world and i have added a vulnerable dependency gin 1.4 which uh, had a cv attached to it so i used that and uh, built my image right um so once you build that i try to scan it using a scanner a container scanning image a container right uh so for my case i used trivi uh so when i used trivi and scan my container um i tried various methods so i first went with a uh, golang bullseye image then i went with a golang alpine and i tried scratch so i compared the number of vulnerabilities between each of these uh, uh images and uh, this is the result that i get uh, so when i built it with a bullseye base image golang bullseye i see that it had 675 vulnerabilities of which eight are part of the golang binary that i built and remaining are part of the debian uh, image itself right now if you see uh, golang itself is a static binary which means i do not have to uh, rely on all the other uh, packages that are part of debian which means anything apart from the eight vulnerabilities are not meant to be uh, used by my uh, binary and it doesn't need to be fixed by me. But however, if I choose to go with this image and go live, there is a possibility that any one of these vulnerabilities could leave me exposed to some sort of attack, right? Um, so I tried Alpine. Uh, luckily, Alpine did not have anything more than the Golang vulnerabilities itself. So Alpine had no vulnerabilities, luckily. And I tried the same with Scratch. And uh, with the Scratch image, I also see that only we had eight vulnerabilities, right? So maybe I'll try to uh, show the results. So if you see here, uh, this is the results that I got from uh, Bullseye image. I had 675 and I tried with Alpine. So Alpine did not have any vulnerabilities and uh, only the binary which I built had eight vulnerabilities. So in case if you are kind of uh, curious about what the application looks like, this is the Docker file. And uh, this is a very simple Golang application. It's a simple web server using Gin, and it uses Gin 1.4, right? Uh, so these are the results. Now going back 
to the presentation. Um, we generally know that uh, you know to build and compile binaries, it is usually possible with compiled languages, right? Um, but there are also cases where you always do not get a static binary out of it. Say, for example, a Java uh, archive, right? It is usually not a static binary. So wherein it might depend on certain system dependencies, right? And there is another class of uh, programming that is called interpreted languages, which do not compile itself, right? But however, there are various projects out there, various experiments that people do that let you compile them into binaries. So here's an experiment that I tried out, right? Uh, in Python, wherein I first create a binary using a, a project called PyInstaller, which helps me create a zip binary, but still which would depend on my system dependencies. And there is another project called StaticX, which is uh, nothing but it takes an input of PyInstaller binary, and it would uh, pack in all the various system dependencies that that particular binary depends on, creates a statically linked binary and gives it to us, right? So when we do this, you get a static binary, which works very similar to a Golang binary, and you can distribute it wherever you want, right? So when you do that, I, I was able to run this in Scratch without any problems. And uh, I've given a link below where you can see that uh, the various experiments that I've been trying out for a couple of months and years. And I'm also planning to continue on that experiment. And uh, based out of which this idea came and the presentation came out. Uh, so here we are. Um, so I tried to build this and uh, I did the same set of experiments. So what did I do here? Uh, I had a vulnerable version of uh, requests package 2.3, had a CV attached to it. I took that, I created a Python project and built containers. Again, did the same three steps. I tried to do a Debian version. I built an Alpine version and I did a scratch version and compared it. This time the results were quite interesting. Um, What's interesting is that when I used Debian Slim, I had 81 vulnerabilities, whereas with Alpine, it's at zero, right? It's at zero. Although I had a vulnerable version of requests in my project, it's at zero. And whereas when I tried to the, do the scan the scratch image, um, it did not even properly scan the image as in it did not detect any packages or any language in it. And it just said that your container is free of vulnerabilities. But ideally, it's not free of vulnerabilities, but the scan did not properly happen at all because Trivi wasn't able to identify what binary was present inside, right? So what does it mean, zero vulnerabilities? Does it mean that your uh, container is secure? Are you compliant? What, what exactly is happening? So, uh, here's the common thing, right? Uh, it's not always that when security tools tell you that uh, you do not have vulnerabilities, it is not always zero. Uh, so make sure to do your due diligence before trusting what the scanner says, right? Because here in our case, here you can see on the right side with the meme I've presented, uh, when you have a scratch container, uh, sometimes the container scanners would miss the vulnerable dependencies, right? Which is right outside there. And something which is hidden deep inside are the system dependencies, which your application might depend on the, you know, the something called as the libraries, shared objects and all these, right? Those are not even being detected, right? So it is possible that your security tools aren't giving you the right results. And in fact, there was a presentation sometime back and there's a repository of uh, listed below where they tried to do the same set of experiments and uh, they came out with similar results. Uh, so I think uh, this presentation kind of aligns to that. And uh, so that's just the thing. So why does this happen? Why why do we see such inconsistencies? Um, it is either because of the scanner or either because of the way that we have built uh, the binaries or the image itself, or it has something to do with the output that the 
you know the the containers give out right so un to understand this right um you need to understand how these scanners work now there are different static scanners out there all these container scanning uh, tools out there uh, they work in different ways uh, so usually the scanners would depend on the package managers itself right say for example you are using debian or something it would depend on apt right if you're using python it would depend on pip or poetry whatever you use for your build system um if you're using golang it would depend on go itself to fetch the dependencies and so on if it's rust you use cargo and uh, maven or cradle when it's java uh, for example right um so it would depend on package managers or sometimes it would depend on your uh, the the docker inspect or the manifest itself sometimes your docker manifest would contain the layers and the layer info wherein it would have the hash values or the the name of the images itself so containers can recognize those against the known hashes in its database and uh, tell you if you know what you're using is vulnerable or not so that is one way so trivi kind of works in that way right they have a database wherein they have the list of all these vulnerable dependencies and their uh, corresponding hash values and uh, trivi would generally say if there is a cv present in your container so that is uh, another way of doing it and third way of doing it is something very recently uh, you know uh, every uh, projects have tried to do uh, something called as attestations uh, wherein you uh, create an s bomb of your container right or your application first and you would attest with your docker image your container image and then uh, pass it on to your scanner so scanner can verify these attestations and use that to verify if these packages are present in your container and then tell you if they are vulnerable or not so that is another way of doing it and the last way of doing it is not something that every scanners would do but very specifically do they do it uh, so they use these language specific debuggers or decompilers or uh, sometimes the language itself supports you know fetching the dependencies from the binaries uh, go does it i'm not pretty sure about how rust handles it in other languages uh, so when you use such kind of debuggers or decompilers or any packages that the language itself provides you will be able to fetch all the dependencies that that particular binary is using so scanners will leverage this uh, these packages and uh, list all the dependencies and then go through each of them and tell you if they're vulnerable or not so that is another way of doing it right so these are the four major ways of how a lot of scanners work or at least uh, what i've seen so far right that is how most of them work um in case i've missed any other methods or uh i've probably misunderstood and misinterpreted and given this message uh you can probably let me know i'll try to correct it um so so far this is my understanding and i'm uh, i've put down these four if there's anything that i've missed just let me know so that's about how scanners work and now uh, when you talk about the concept of binaries right and uh, the concept where binaries would depend on system dependencies system packages right uh, you would come across this term called shared shared objects right uh, shared objects are nothing but your system packages these are usually statically linked or dynamically linked in your binary depending on what type of language or what type of type of compilation you're doing or what's your use case uh, so dynamics when your application would rely on these libraries at runtime wherein it is looking if this particular library is present at runtime and if not your application would fail and static is when it would link and it would have the libraries within the binary itself so it need not worry about the library being lost in your host right uh, so that is static linking so when you do static linking so applications like go when you build a project in go they do static linking so when you do static linking um you do not have to worry about any libraries that would be missed 
when you kind of distribute it to someone else, right? So that is where languages like Golang shine. And now if I go a little back, right, to this uh, example of the Python app that I showed, uh, I told you that Python is interpreted and I tried to create a binary out of it. Here I would have done two steps. One is uh, using PyInstaller and another uh, tool is StaticX. So just like I said, uh, PyInstaller is just creating a binary of the Python itself, the Python application itself, which means it is packing the Python runtime and my application together and provides me a binary. Right, it can be run in my system, and it is possible that if I distribute it to somebody else, it might not run because your Python app might depend on some system libraries, and uh, it is possible that it is not present in another system, and it could fail. Right, so that is where uh, you try to do static linking with this tool called StaticX, and when you do that, StaticX will basically look for all the various uh, system dependencies that your the Python binary is depending on, uh, pull all of that, create a binary out of it and give it to you, right? Now there would be questions like, uh, how big would be uh, this binary be, right? Um, it is possible that your binary could be huge in size because considering the way how Python works and how PyInstaller and StaticX itself works, right? Uh, so it is possible that your binary could be a little bigger than expected, um, but that is the trade-off you have to go with when you're trying to do such experiments, right? Um, so, so that's how it is. And uh, just like I mentioned before earlier, these are all experiments, so please try it at your risk and don't use it in your production. Uh, so that's a disclaimer again. So this is an example of how the dynamic linking and static linking works. When you take the output of PyInstaller and use it, it is using dynamically linked uh, objects. So it cannot run uh, across platforms. There is a possibility that it would break. But if you use StaticX, it is possible that you can still manage to run the binary across most of the systems, right? Regardless if it is a different architecture and a different platform, then it might not run. But then if it's a same architecture and similar platform, there is a possibility that you can still run this uh, binary without any problems. So that's so far how I've come with my experiment in Python. Uh, I'm hoping to, you know, kind of take this forward and see how it works. Uh, now I've primarily worked with uh, creating lean containers in Python and experimenting with the security side of it. Uh, but probably, you know, Java and other languages are very good examples. And I'd like to try those in future. So if at all possible, you know, I come with some good results or good solutions. Uh, it is possible that I could be talking about it in a different conference or probably write a blog post about it. So hang tight for that. Okay, we've come so far. And I think we are close to completion. I'm not sure how much time we have. Uh, I think we have another 30 minutes. Um, so let's walk through. So here's a nice big poster, the multiverse of binaries, right? Uh, let's talk a little bit of, about how binaries are, right? Different types of binaries. So we've discussed so far about static linking and dynamic linking, right? Uh, there are a lot of problems with binary uh, binary distribution and probably we can discuss those. Right. Uh, the very first thing is that uh, binaries needs to be platform independent, right? They might not be uh, made for all the platforms, which means you can only distribute it to platforms it is meant to run. For example, you built it in Mac OS. It might not run in Windows and Linux. Um, maybe some other languages like Go, if you create a binary, it's universal and it runs everywhere. And there are certain other cases where you try to, you know, solve this problem and create a platform independent binary. Uh, you might have the architecture problem of AMD 64 and ARM 64, right? Uh, so platform independency is one architecture is another thing. Uh, so sometimes you have to, you know, uh, focus on these two if in case you're trying to build binaries that needs to be distributable across different architectures and platforms. 
Um, so usually even with when you build uh, container images, uh, people would talk about multi-platform images and multi-architecture images, right? Uh, not essentially multi-platform, but multi-architecture, wherein your, uh, your container need to run in ARM or AMD64, regardless of what platform you're running in. Um, but if it's outside Docker, then the case is different, wherein you have to worry about the platform and the architecture itself. Um, so that's the multiverse. Um, so I can probably walk you through a little bit of uh, problems here and uh, why things are working, why things aren't working. Most of these have been covered previously, but let me just kind of uh, walk you through. Um, so here's the gist, right? Each language, uh, each languages and uh, compilers work very differently, right? Um, not essentially always the same. Sometimes the behavior might also change depending on your platforms. Um, when I say the behaviors, the way it stores images and the way it stores your uh, binaries. Uh, for example, if you have to take Docker itself, I can tell you that Docker behavior is not the same across Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. It works very differently, right? Uh, for Mac OS, for example, it cannot directly run. It depends on creating a virtual machine and run inside it. And I think it's also the same case for Windows. I've primarily not used Windows a lot, so I cannot comment on it. Uh, but talking about languages, I think it's also a little bit different uh, because uh, say, for example, uh, the way your files are structured, uh, your language might depend on different file paths on different platforms. Uh, so it's possible there are such uh, dependencies. Uh, so some, some languages handle it gracefully, others might not. Uh, you have to be very explicit about it. For example, Python. Um, I think for languages like uh, Go and Go, Java, or other things, I think they are uh, very much platform independent in such cases. Uh, compilers as well kind of work differently. Now there are standard compilers that uh, you know the language would come with the recommended compilers. And people would have created forks of these compilers with a lot of benefits and other use cases. Um, so it is possible that each compiler has different instructions and they work differently. Uh, I've seen some organizations, organizations trying to have their own set of compilers with uh, specific instructions according to, the, to their policies to help them build binaries that uh, work in such a way, right? So compiler behavior can also change. Uh, from platform to platform, from uh, compiler to compiler itself, right? Um, so that's one. Another thing that uh, I kind of understood with the experiment that I was doing, right? Uh, I think that static building for interpreted languages uh, is not very uh, recommended and also kind of not, you know, kind of uh, readable by a lot of scanners today because uh, generally, when the scanners are made an assumption that interpreted languages are always interpreted, uh, then they are meant to be distributed in such a way. And compiled languages are always meant to be distributed in such a way, right? So most of these scanners would have a certain set of uh, guidelines, or I would say uh, the behavior of the scanners would change, right? Uh, it would expect something to be in some format. And when the scanner uh, doesn't uh, get that format, it wouldn't scan or behave in the in an expected way, right? Again, it's a common developer thing, right? You expect things to work in some uh, in a particular way. You so you build uh, tools that are very opinionated, so things happen like that. So this is one such case, right? Um, so I've seen a lot of examples of these. Uh, for instance, I've seen some tools where. Uh, it expected a framework to be presented in a particular file structure, a folder structure, but it wasn't, and the scanner did not properly fully scan the project, uh, thereby losing a lot of vulnerabilities there. It did not capture. Uh, so those are such opinionated cases which a lot of scanners suffer with today. But I think uh, some scanners are coming out of that way. For example, Trivi, uh, some time back did not have the capabilities of scanning binaries, only files, even for the case of Go, it would rely on the Go mod file or the Go sum file to be present. 
but today I think it supports uh, for languages like Rust and for languages like Go. Uh, even without the presence of your cargo lock or, or the Go sum, for example, uh, it is able to still uh, read through the binary and show all the vulnerabilities present. And even in fact, uh, Trivi is able to uh, generate the SBOM itself, right? And most of it seems to be very complete, but I'm not quite sure of how complete it is. I've never uh, kind of dig deeper into it. So that's there. And so for the case of the second one, um, that's the point of the, the I'm trying to say. Scanner should have the first class support to read dependencies from binaries, right? Because each binary is just like I said, are built in different ways. Uh, they are very different. So scanners should have the first class support of that binary, the, the language itself, so that it is able to read dependencies. Now, even though it has first class support, only if the language allows you to do it, then you can do it, right? So I think in that in that case, most of the language let you do it because there are use cases where you have to look at what is inside your binary. And uh, so it allows you to do it. But I'm not quite sure about how Rust works because um, Rust, Rust binaries are usually kind of different. And I've seen that decompiling a Rust binary is very different. And the procedure to do it is very different from what you do with Golang. And uh, so I'm not quite sure about how it how it's handled, uh, but that's the case. Until and unless the language supports it, I don't think scanners can actually do it in the right way or at least in the complete way. Um, so I think uh, that's a long way to go for scanners and let's see how it goes. Um, so although you have these first class support, although the language was able to you know parse all these binaries and everything, uh, it is possible that these shared objects are still lost, right? In case of the experiment with Python added. I'm not quite sure even if the scanners would support a static X binary built, right? I'm not quite sure how far it would be able to go with uh, scanning the shared object because mostly what I've seen is that in order to kind of identify the shared objects, uh, most of these scanners depend on the package manager itself, right? Uh, so since within a binary, you do not have an environment, uh, say what OS it is, I'm not quite sure how scanners would be able to scan for those packages when a package manager is not present. Uh, so that's a good uh, place to look out for. Um, I'm expecting some scanner someday to probably uh, address those problems. And now, if... Although, right, you do it, even if parsers can uh, probably not have that support and still it can uh, identify patterns in the disassembled code, right? There is a chance, there is a small chance that you can still identify those statically linked file information, right? Uh, I'm not sure how far it would go, but there is a chance you can do it, right? Uh, for example, here, uh, I have this uh, Go app, right? I have built a binary out of my Go project. So if I try to do strings app, and if I grab out that information and uh, search for the word Golang, um, sorry about that. You can see a list of uh, dependencies. So these are the dependency formats that you see in your Go sum, right? Uh, I can see almost all of it here. Now this is working with Golang binary. I'm not sure how it would work for other languages because I've not tried out. But so if parsers are able to support such features, then it is possible that uh, you can identify the statically linked information. Now, maybe if you are trying to do this experiment, if you want to carry out this experiment just like I do, these are some things that uh, we could probably try out and see how far, how effective it is. And probably we could, you know, uh, create a scanner or probably create a feature request for scanners like Trivi or JFrog or whatever, right? Um, so that's the case. But uh, there is, it is possible that although you do all of these, parsing the disassembled code or uh, you read the static binaries, it is possible that the results can be incomplete and uh, I'm not quite sure how far you can get the accurate uh, SBOM from your uh, binary or the scratch containers. 
So it is possible such details would be missing and we have to see how effective it is. Um, but also talking about all these problems, right? What is that one good thing that Scratch Container offers is that a lot of vulnerabilities, right? Which is present in your code or the third party application itself uh, could become unre unreachable or could be obsolete itself because uh, when somebody tries to attack your application, right? Uh, say for example, they try to do an injection or they try to do a remote code execution. It is possible that uh, they don't, it doesn't happen and your container simply uh, dies and restarts, right? Because your container does not have any runtime in it. So even if somebody tries to exploit such vulnerabilities, it is possible that you're still safe, right? So it's just a certain part of that vulnerabilities. Um, but in case if your application has other vulnerabilities, which is not directly dealing with the containers, but within your application, your business logics, it is possible such vulnerabilities are still exploitable, right? But at least on the supply chain side with the third party dependencies, this is one good thing that Scratch Containers offers. Right. So I've talked about uh, the common caveats and uh, other ways of you know trying out different experiments. Uh, so these are the other scanning options, just like I told before. Uh, you could read out the printable strings from the binary to see if they have these metadata or the build information, for example. Um, sometimes there are language debuggers that help you list out all this information, right? And then even uh, there are some compilers which allow you to generate metadata at build time. So if, if there is a case, then use that metadata to scan and uh, identify if there are any vulnerabilities present in third-party components. So that is another way of doing it. So these are common ways of doing it. Uh, I'm not sure if there is a right way to do it or a wrong way to do it. But one thing we can say is that although we go for scratch and although we try to do all these experiments, um, it is, it is we cannot guarantee that scratch containers are always 100% secure. Just like it goes, as there goes a saying that no systems are 100% secure, right? Uh, so even Scratch doesn't offer that. But however, it helps you reduce the attack surface and minimize the exposure that your application goes through. Uh, so that should help you, um, you know, go somewhere around there and have that compliance. Um, so that's how it is. So just like I said, while Scratch reduces the attack surface and it helps minimize the chances of exploiting any vulnerability that your container has, right? Uh, but you will add overhead to yourself, right? When it's a normal build, you don't have to worry about any overheads. It's just a normal build steps. But when you go with Scratch, you, had to, you have to do certain things, right? Uh, for example, uh, the Golang application itself, which I showed, was very pretty simple and straightforward. But in order for me to get it working, I had to have... Uh, the CGO enabled set to zero. Uh, so that's basically the go C linking. So in case your go uh, images, go applications, depending on any of the C headers or dependencies, you have this variable set and it would not. And you had to set some LD flags to strip and remove all the internal paths and static stuff. And uh, only after having this, my go build uh, binary was able to run in a scratch container without any dependencies. Uh, so that's how it is. But from a security standpoint, when after you scan, most of us think that the container is clean and uh, safe, but it's not always the case. So watch out. So after talking all this, after listening to how Scratch works, and uh, if you think that you cannot Scratch, right, try, try DistroLess. Now DistroLess is another concept where uh, somebody, the vendor would create you a minimal version of your base image, right? Say, for example, you need Golang. They would create a minimal version of a Go image, Go parent image, and that would not have any shell attached to it or package managers to it, but still it would carry any dependencies that you would need. And in order to do that, there are different ways. So, for example, you have to use tools like Bessel, or if you go for uh, containers like ChainGuard, they would provide you the way of doing it. There's something called Wolfie images with chain guard. And uh, 
they have a way of building chain gauge images and use it with your application. So if Scratch is not the thing for you, DistroLess could be a way to get out of it. Um, but again, there are certain complications that we have to deal with DistroLess because regardless of whether you go with Scratch or DistroLess, it's always a trial and error method that you have to deal with, right? Uh, at least with Scratch, you have the flexibility of building, uh, building your applications and then distributing without having to worry about having additional steps. But with DistroLess, you have to create your own uh, parent images if the readily available images aren't the right ones for you. So uh, there are Naveen, such... we have just five minutes left. Amazing. I'm almost done. So I think, yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, so these are some reflections that we do. Uh, so the questions we have answered, does building apps on Scratch help reduce supply chain issues? Maybe we have spoken about it. Uh, we have talked about the build time trouble and the security trouble. And uh, so that's mostly of all of it. So although just like I said, the major takeaway is that even though your scanner says it is zero vulnerabilities, uh, it's possible that you're not really compliant or really secure. So do your due, due diligence there. So that's almost all of it. And there is a long way to go for this experiment for me, for all the scanners out there and for the containers. So that's all it. And uh, most of what I do is present in my experimental project. That's a link given below. Uh, you can probably take a look at it. And you know, if you'd like to uh, have additional experiments, please feel free to. So that's mostly it, and I'm open to questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Naveen. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm sure like audience uh, will have some questions. If you still have some questions, you can post. Meanwhile, I'll ask a couple of them. So uh, the first question is, do we have any dynamic vulnerability scanners available uh, for Scratch or for containers, let's say, um, or any? Right. I think there are some scanners that do runtime container security scans, but I okay. think it would involve you having the agent within your application. For example, there would be a dependency. For example, if it's Go, you have to have a Go package along with your binary. And I think that would probably run along with your container right. and uh, tell if there are any runtime vulnerabilities. That is, it would fetch all the dynamically loaded libraries or whatever and tell you okay. what's happening in the runtime. So that is possible. I think there are some uh, tools out there, but uh, readily I'm not quite sure if I know the names. Okay. But okay, sure. okay. So uh, there's another question, like uh, uh, what role does index index indexing play to detect vulnerability? Is there any role played, like some indexing uh, mechanism available that is to detect the vulnerability? Um. I'm not sure if I understood the term indexing correctly, but uh, okay. if it's something to do with creating S bombs, uh, okay. I think yes. If that is the question, then yes. Uh, there are okay. ways where you can uh, generate S bomb out of your container and scan it. Uh, but in order to do that, you have to generate an S bomb before you create a binary, if you go for mm -hmm. scratch, and then use that S bomb to scan for any vulnerabilities. Uh, but after building your binary, I'm not quite sure how many tools allow you to create test bombs because of the uh, various challenges that I spoke about. Right. right. So uh, any other question, audience? I mean, you can post your questions. You can still post your questions. We have about two, three minutes left. So if that is all, uh, uh, thank you, Naveen. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, audience, if you wish to contact, uh, he already shared his uh, he flashed his GitHub uh, page. You can just follow and uh, check out the information. Yeah. So thank Let's you so much. Again. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks everybody we have... here my okay. social media. Just feel free to reach out. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you.